acronyms were just tantalizing. Good afternoon. I think I saw some other folks in the hall if you want to <clears throat> yell at them. Come on up here, Cora. I'm here to introduce uh, General Michael Ryan, Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, who's going to be talking to you today about an upcoming um, Air Force Expeditionary Force experiment, and then he'll be introducing Major General Hawley from Air Combat Command. Hi, great being with you. After the after the Oscar nominations, this will be a little bit slower. Um, we're excited about uh, uh, experimentation in the armed armed forces, and particularly in the Air Force, uh, where we've been the last few years uh, since Desert Storm has been in the expeditionary mode, as I've talked to a lot of you about. And part of that expeditionary mode is the ability to command and control whatever forces you have forward. Part of that is backing up even further is to be able to get that show on the road fairly quickly and make sure you have the command and control of those forces uh, in the best shape you can have it as you go forward. And that has to do with ISR and, and uh, rapid uh, capability to bring command elements forward uh, in your command and control structure and communications, et cetera. So I'm, uh, I'm excited about where we're going in the United States Air Force on that issue, particularly with respect to this expeditionary uh, force experiment, which we call EFX, which we'll be doing next fall. Uh, here today uh, to talk to you a little bit about it um, is uh, Major General John Hawley from our command and control agency uh, down in Virginia. Uh, please listen uh, to him and, uh, and uh, ask him the questions that you think are uh, are, will bring out the kinds of answers that uh, we need on these on these issues. Uh, we are very much into this uh, revolution in military affairs, and part of that is right on the front end, and that is command and control. And John's going to give you a good brief on how this is going to go down. And I invite a lot of you, or all of you, to uh, come and see it when we do it uh, uh, this fall. I think it'll be a very, very interesting experiment for all of us. So, uh, John, over to you. Well, like the chief said, you know, the EFX task force is very excited about today's events and the opportunity to uh, provide some of the details of our 1998 experimental activities. EFX 98 is the centerpiece of a set of activities that will forever improve the quality of uh, America's armed forces by accelerating the fielding of new concepts, ideas, and equipment for frontline warfighters. Simply put, EFX is an investment in America's leadership, future, and the well-being of its citizens. It's about moving more information and fewer people to the front lines and getting just the right resources to the right place at the right time. It's also about providing commanders the right information at the right time so they can attack just the right targets in the right way at the right time. No more and no less. To do this, we must experiment. Unlike military exercises, where we train military members on established procedures, experiments test new unproven initiatives, doctrine, and equipment that one day may become reality and fielded in our forces. This year, our experiments focus on command and control, or C2, the lifeblood of the Air Force. Command and control is the leadership behind the aircraft. It's about the commanders communicating their intent and decisions to their staff so that frontline warfighters know where to go what to shoot and what weapons to use to carry out the commander's objectives. Think of it as a football game where the commander is the coach, the commander's battle staff is the quarterback, and the rest of the football players are the warfighters. The coach assesses the situation and directs the quarterback, who relays it to the rest of the team. Just like the football coach, the commander assesses the situation and directs the battle staff, who relays that information directly to the warfighter. How well that communication takes place is critical. That's where EFX 98 comes in. EFX tests a way to give commanders near real-time knowledge of what's occurring in the battle space by linking sensors to command centers and command centers to the shooters through a secure global area network of communications. That's how we plan to win in the future, by moving information to the front lines and fewer people. EFX 98, like any experiment, is based on an if-then hypothesis, and here's ours. 
We'll be experimenting with about 40 individual command and control related initiatives. However, each will be integrated into one of the five overall initiatives I'll now explain. The first two of our five major initiatives focus on the forward and rear Joint Air Operations Center. Back in 1990, during Desert Shield, we moved more than 1,500 to 2,000 people to our Forward Joint Service Air Operations Center, or JAOC. A forward JOC, of course, is where we command and control our aerospace forces from in the area of conflict. Now, it took about 10 to 15 days and 25 C-17 equivalent aircraft loads to move all those people and all their equipment to the forward operating location. Not only did it consume a lot of critical airlift resources, but it cost us about $4 million to just to deploy that one command center. Once in place, we noticed the commander and his battle staff continued to communicate almost continuously with constant or, or with dozens of rear uh, area bases back in the CONUS. You might say they were reaching back to the U.S. and its allies for information, but in a somewhat ad hoc fashion. The new concept we're testing in EFX-98 proposes to get the Joint Air Operations Center command and control job done by moving only about 100 key people forward to the front lines. These individuals will be equipped with a suite of the very latest communications and information technology that will fit into no more than, say, one or two C-17s. Now, these 100 key people and all their equipment can now be moved to almost any location in the world in less than a day. And instead of communicating with all those stateside bases individually, we're developing a consolidated rear joint air operations center, uh, or rear JAOC, at Langley Air Force Base uh, down in southern Virginia. Uh, there'll be a staff of about 300 individuals there to support the 100 forward deployed people. Through our global area network, we can connect with thousands of other command and control personnel back at their home stations who also support our 100 people that are deployed forward. Think of this rear JAOC as a kind of a 1-800 help desk, if you will, for the forward deployed aerospace force commander and his or her staff. The result? about 95 percent fewer people are at risk on the front lines with no change in capability. We also save approximately $3.8 million per JAOC deployment. In conflict, the Joint Forces Air Component Commander, or JFAC, controls the aerospace forces of all the armed services, not just the Air Force. EFX-98 will experiment with giving the JFAC complete and total battle space awareness at all times even while uh, they're en route to the forward area. And we'll do this by connecting both his forward and rear area command centers uh, and a transport aircraft to that global area network of information I mentioned previously. This means the JFAC can react instantly to any changes occurring in the battle space, no matter where he or she is, i.e., uh, maybe they're in the rear Joint Air Operations Center, the forward Joint Air Operations Center, or while moving to or around the area of conflict. Now, in war, seconds are critical, and minutes may be too late. But with better and faster and a constant flow of information, the JFAC will make better and more timely decisions, which will in turn shorten conflicts and save American lives. Now, our sensor to decision maker to shooter experiments will greatly improve the JFAC's ability to rapidly direct attacks or counterattacks on time-sensitive targets. Commanders at all levels, to include aircraft commanders, mission commanders, component commanders and joint force commanders will all be able to react almost immediately to what's going on in the battle space since they'll be linked directly with the global area network we spoke to earlier. SDS initiatives will greatly increase all warfighters' battle space awareness. We will give them automated tools to plan missions en route and retarget as the battle space changes and suggest other courses of action to higher echelons as necessary. Now, the first 15 days of an air war are critical to victory. Again, it's imperative we get the right resources to the right places at the right time. And in the first 15 days of an air war, uh, that means the faster the better. The last set of initiatives focus on speed. Now, we've already proven our ability to get bombs on target from a stateside base within 24 hours of the execute order, uh, and that's when directed uh, by the President or the Secretary of Defense. But EFX-98 experiments will continue to improve combat capabilities by launching bombers almost immediately, perhaps with only partial mission plans. 
Uh, we plan to experiment with new ways of issuing en route target changes to attacking aircraft and will practice passing updated threat information to air crews while they're en route to their targets. These changes will come from the JFAC, who, as you'll recall, is constantly tuned in to the changes that are occurring in the battle space. We have a goal to get our fighter aircraft with required support people and equipment to the area of conflict within 48 hours of an execute order. EFX-98 will be testing many new support concepts that will greatly reduce our forward footprints and enhance our capabilities to move forward faster. Now, I've spoken about how we plan to keep the JFAC situationally aware en route to the forward area by plugging his aircraft into the global area network. We plan to do this by passing much of the required information over the global broadcast system. I should also point out that as we experiment, we'll be aggressively testing our ability to protect our information systems. We are acutely aware of potential vulnerabilities when we employ electronic and space communication systems. The complete and total protection and safeguarding of our air and space assets, especially electronic information, is a top priority in EFX-98. All the initiatives I've discussed today will be tested during our execution phase, which will be held uh, in September uh, from the 14th through the 26th. The execution phase of the experiment features a combination of real aircraft and realistic simulations to create a true warfighting environment. Embedded in the live fly part of the experiment is our annual aerospace power demonstration, which will be held on September 18th at Eglin Air Force Base, Florida. Of course, all of you are invited to attend, and, and I hope to see you there. To best prepare for our experiment, we're planning three EFX spirals or smaller scale technical trials. And these will occur in April, in July, and another one in late August. Now these spirals will further help us evaluate our original hypothesis and point us in the direction that we need to go. How much will EFX 98 cost? Well, first, I like to think of this more as an investment rather than a cost. We're planning to invest $40 million into creating this operationally realistic experiment that will pay huge dividends by accelerating the fielding of new concepts and technologies to the frontline warfighters. Again, this is not an exercise. It's an experiment. We must take this venture into the future if we are to find new and better ways to fight as an aerospace expeditionary force in the 21st century. Each of the initiatives we've included are relatively mature concepts or technologies and are geared toward proving our hypothesis. Now, we recognize our results may not end up exactly as predicted, but we're going to learn and, in the end, deliver better warfighting technology and concepts for America. Think about it. If we learn something from this experiment that allows us to make just one better budget decision, we'll likely save the American taxpayers the cost of this experiment and much, much more. Another cost benefit to EFX is what's called leave behinds. That's technology and capability purchased or gained from this experiment that can remain in place and continue to be used by the operators at the location. <laughs> we are projecting 40 percent of the EFX-98 funding is going toward purchasing items that will be fielded immediately. That's new technology and capability the Air Force needs to help protect America. EFX is a joint service venture, and I'm looking forward to more joint emphasis in the next few years. In addition, we're also partnering with industry, for they've developed many of the initiatives that are in the experiment. Needless to say, I'm really excited about EFX-98 and the whole EFX concept. This experiment will help us redefine how we're going to fight in the future. I look forward to inviting you and the American public to join us in our experimentation journey into the future. Now I'll take your questions. General, could you tell us how the – you talk about the joint partners here, and, and the, there's all, obviously a lot of emphasis in this building on joint war fighting now. What role will the, will the Army, Navy, and the Corps play in this experiment? How, how will that be set up? Uh, certainly within our joint air operations centers, they will be manned by joint staff. So that will uh, include members from all the services that will participate with us in those uh, command and control centers. In addition, um, it looks like we're going to be able to have the 82nd Airborne participate with us and actually uh, do a drop into, into the forward area, the simulated forward area, which is on the Eglin Range Complex. And uh, they will uh, be securing the area uh, where we insert our forward AOC, or Joint Air Operations Center. So uh, there's full participation by, uh, by all the services in that regard. 
None, yes, of, this, sir. none of this is going to take place overseas. This is a domestic. Yes, that's correct. Exercise. Yeah, it's really all in the eastern part of the United States, kind of between Langley and down to Eglin. Will there, will there be any uh, international participation, uh, allied observers, things like that? Yes, I think uh, there will be. We have had some requests uh, for observers, and uh, certainly it's open to the public, and, and we, we invite that to, to happen. Uh, the other thing I'd say on participation, of course, aircraft will be, will be coming from all over, uh, as you can see, from several places uh, around the United States. Um, we will be linking back into several command and information centers across the United States. So, uh, you know, the, the, the main uh, part of the experiment will, will uh, be between Langley and Eglin, but there'll be a lot more players than that, really. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, you're um, comparing sending uh, 1,500 to 2,000 people forward in uh, Desert Shield to sending about uh, 100 to 200 forward in a, for an AEF. Mm -hmm. But a typical AEF is much smaller than the force that was sent to Desert Shield. Mm -hmm. Why not compare? Yeah, well, we're not really differentiating in size. I mean, this is uh, what we're experimenting with is uh, a capability to send only 100 or 200 people forward, uh, even for a rather major conflict. Uh, and, of course, the actual size of an AEF, uh, you know, we task organize our force uh, uh, based on the mission that the National Command Authority would give us. And so AEF sometimes are small, but they could be larger, too. Mm -hmm. Sure. What can you tell us about the exercise scenario? What's it going to look like in September? Uh, well, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's based on uh, a Southwest Asia scenario. That's about all I can say. Uh, but uh, there's going to be, a, as you would expect, a, a blue land and a, and a red land and, and neutrals and... <laughs> And uh, so it's going to be rather generic, actually, in, in terms of uh, uh, the scenario itself. How many sorties do you plan to mount? So what would be your maximum effort? Yeah, probably the life fly will only be uh, somewhere around 60 sorties per day or so. Uh, but that's not all of it. As I pointed out, uh, we're uh, including uh, modeling and simulation, and uh, the sorties that our task out of this Air Operations Center and the ATO will be maybe up to 1,000 a day. But the ones that don't actually live fly will fly in our models and will feed back into, uh, into the experiment. Yes, sir. I don't notice any uh, bombers that are white men on the list. Uh, are, is the assumption now that sinks won't ask for them because they're too expensive? Is that well, why they're not actually, using them? Actually, they're there. You just can't see them. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, what we found out, of course, you know, we don't have very many. Uh, of those bombers. Uh, B-2s out there is what he's asking about. And uh, so they've been rather uh, limited assets. But uh, just recently, in fact, since we made that poster, we have found that it looks like we're going to have some B-2 participation. So uh, no, we're, uh, they're, uh, they are a part of the experiment. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Can you say how many people in all might be involved in this? Boy, that's, that's really hard to say. We've only talked about uh, the numbers of people that are in the, uh, the two air operation centers, the split air, air operation center, if you will. But there's a, there are going to be a lot more folks involved in uh, flying all those aircraft and participating. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people in other uh, command and information centers uh, throughout CONUS that are linked together into this uh, network that will be participating. And uh, I don't think we've actually been able to put a number on it. Uh, but it's, it's going to be uh, uh, in the hundreds, oh, okay. several All hundreds, right. I'd okay. say. Okay, several hundreds, I'd say. Can, sure. can you give us a, a prospective mission, a real, uh, a real scenario such, say, Korea? Mm -hmm. uh, would your mission then be primarily an uh, uh, air superiority or a troop cover, or uh, mm -hmm. what do you foresee, say, in the case of Korea? Yeah, sure, of course. Uh, Again, as we've kind of pointed out, the feature of EFX-98 is uh, we're really focusing on uh, uh, new future command and control uh, capabilities. Uh, in Korea, uh, we have an in-place command and control capability, so we may not have to deploy anyone there because we have people there every day. Uh, this set ready to do this. So what you already have. Uh, it could be. It could be. Or if something uh, flared up someplace, uh, maybe as Korea was going on in some other location, uh, and we needed to put another command and control uh, center in there, we could rapidly deploy this uh, forward center, and then they'd be reaching back. Who's challenging the U.S. Air Force? Where is there a challenge at all? In the air, that is. Yeah, well, you know, we don't really know where we're going to fight next. Uh, and that's really the purpose of this. 
but uh, all I know is uh, we've been engaged uh, around the world in several different places. There's many things that come up uh, that uh, require a presence of a command and control capability. It may be something as uh, the evacuation of an embassy, or it could be a re reaction to a disaster. And a capability like this that you can you can uh, deploy very rapidly, um, uh, it will be very useful in the future, I believe. Yes, sir. Is it safe to characterize this as sort of building on the general AEF concept, and just kind of bringing that into the future? Sure, of course, you, you have to be able to command and control forces, no matter how big or how small. And of course, the uh, emphasis behind our air, AEF concept, or aerospace expeditionary force concept, is to be able to uh, deploy force rapidly. And to do that, you're going to have to be able to command and control them. And uh, the size of that force will gradually build over time. But uh, we wanted to be able to get something there very rapidly, uh, and, but in a very small footprint, and, and uh, to support our AEF concept. Could, uh, could you explain? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Let me take a couple in the back. I'm sorry. Uh, can you elaborate on how you're going to test uh, the security of your C2 systems and your information systems? Mm -hmm. Is that going to be part of a red team uh, scenario? Well, I can't get into too much detail. But uh, suffice it to say that, that uh, the way you keep people from getting in access to your information is, is you do good systems design up front, and you put in the right things in, in place to, to prevent intruders. Uh, and we'll be uh, testing to see if uh, um, we ha have good systems design as part of the experiment and see what we can learn uh, about our systems design and our ability to keep intruders out. So you're going to have people trying to hack their way in? Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Could you explain? You're probably out there every day doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. Could you explain what the global area network and the global broadcasting system is, how, the, how they work, uh, what mm -hmm. they are? Sure. Well, it's a, it's a global area network of information. Uh, I kind of think of it like, a, like an intranet in that it's isolated from the internet. But it will be uh, common databases of uh, information that could be anywhere around the globe, really, and that we link them together. Uh, through our global grid of communications, which is out there every day, and we use it every day when we make telephone calls around the world, et cetera, right? And uh, so that's really the, the backbone, and, and we're trying to create a, a, what we call a shared data environment, okay, by linking these uh, common databases together and uh, then making this information and putting it right at the fingertips of, uh, of the battle staff and the commander. You know, what, what takes a lot of time in a command center is digging for information, making telephone calls and, and uh, trying to dig for information. If you can put it at the fingertips, now you can reduce the size of your staffs, you know, which is what's helping us here in terms of reducing our, our footprint as well, is putting more uh, information at the fingertips of uh, those battle managers. General, that sounds a lot like what the, the Navy has talked about in, in, with cooperative engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, are, are you building a separate architecture from that? Are we investing not in a Navy version of the system and in an Air Force version of the not same a, Not system? at all. What we're doing is we're just doing our Air Force part to support the global command and control system, uh, which uh, is, is the direction that we all want to head. Uh, the Navy's uh, cooperative engagement architecture, as I understand, uh, focuses really more down at the tactical level, the shooter level. What we're doing here is, is at the operational level of, of warfare. It's at the level above that. Okay. Will you be doing anything at the shooter level? You talked earlier about uh, maybe sending bombers off before they really have their uh, full tasking. Uh, are you going to be doing any of that en route stuff with this aircraft? Yes, definitely. And that's, that's part of the experiment. Can we do that? How much mission planning can we do en route? How do we get information to those aircrafts uh, so that they can do good mission planning en route? Will they have special equipment to receive uh, information en route? Yes. Yes, they will. Uh, and uh, that's Part of the experiment as well is, is how do we get larger pipes, larger bandwidth, more bandwidth to aircraft platforms so that we can get them information uh, so that they can do these kinds of things. And so that, that's what, what we're doing. Uh, let's see. Yes, ma'am. What, uh, what brought this about? What were the problems that uh, you s 
it seems from exercises that you've had in the past, they weren't really filling the bill for you mm -hmm. that you needed to, to bring this sort well, of... Well, they are, but, uh, you know, in an exercise, you're really focusing on taking what you have today, you know, that's already fielded equipment, and you're training the people that have to use that equipment on how to use that equipment. It's not really focused on, on uh, future capabilities in an exercise. It's the purpose for an exercise is to train. The purpose for an experiment is to learn, really, and to learn about the future and where we'd have to uh, take things in the future. How do you see the results of this coming out? What will happen from the information that you get? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, uh, the bottom line is that we're going to be able to, to get user involvement in uh, some of these developments much sooner than we would be able to do otherwise by putting a, creating an operationally realistic environment in which to put uh, some of these advanced systems and get user feedback right away. Uh, now the developer can take that feedback and continue to uh, work it into to the development of the system and uh, not just deliver something to the user that the user says, well, that's not quite what I, what I wanted. It may have been what I said, but it's not quite what I wanted. So you have the industry folks that deeply Oh, exactly. Involved in they're, this. they're part of the team, and uh, they're right in there with us all the way. Um, and they're very anxious to get the feedback uh, from this experiment, and uh, by having all these users and, and air crews and commanders involved. Will there be industry people involved in, in the experiment? Uh, most definitely. Uh, those who uh, uh, have brought uh, experiments uh, into uh, the the uh, EFX will have access to, to uh, and, and will learn from that experiment as much or more than we'll probably learn. Uh, they'll be right there gathering data on how their system performs. Yes, sir. What do you figure this will cost? Uh, the direct cost to, to create the experiment and set it up, as I said in my remarks, is, is $40 million. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, let me see if I understand this right. You'll be taking information from the theater where you're going to be having the operation. Mm -hmm. sending it back to the U.S., deciding what to do with it, and sending it either to the people who are en route to the, the mm -hmm. theater or already in the theater and telling them what to do. Mm -hmm. Is there some danger that the decisions are going to be made too far from the location mm -hmm. uh, and there will be a disconnect between what's really there and what the perception well, is? Well, not really, because all the people that work in these two command centers work for the, the Joint Forces Air Component Commander, the JFAC, who is, still who is the decision there. maker. And he'll still be in yes. He is the decision maker, and what's going to be different now is is uh, he or she will have the be able to, uh, to to move and stay constantly aware of what's going on and be in communication with the staff. So I, I really think uh, I think this is a, a great improvement. It's going to allow the commander to move around the battle space, if you will, around the, the battlefield, and uh, be more tuned in to what's what's occurring there. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. A kind of a futuristic question, I guess, but if the concept of this would prove out, I mean, down the road, could you see having a smaller Air Force? Um, you know, I think we want an Air Force that has improved capabilities. That's what this is about. Uh, what size our Air Force is, uh, is a decision that, that will be made uh, probably here in Washington and over on the Hill. Uh, but we're about uh, taking the resources that we have and improving our capabilities. Uh, yes, give us an idea of the balance of intelligence information, real-time intelligence information from uh, aircraft, from satellite, or from JSTARS. What kind of mix do you think you're going to be getting for changing targets in flight? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly uh, anywhere information comes from, uh, to include sensors, sensor systems, as you point out, uh, that are looking at uh, where the adversary is, as well as another key p bit of uh, information that a commander needs is uh, information on, a, on his own force, or the blue forces, if you will. Um, the other part is neutrals. You have to know where the neutrals are. Um, the combat ID problem is, is very important. Um, how much information will be coming from where, quite frankly, uh, you know, we're going to learn a lot more about it in the experiment. But uh, the, uh, our sensor systems, uh, are, we're doing our very best within the resources that we have to be able to, to bring that information to bear. Your tactical uh, sensors, uh, your tactical observation, I mean, there, used to, there was a shortage in Desert Storm of reconnaissance uh, aircraft. Uh, 
-hmm. at some points in some places. Uh, are you going to have any more there, or uh, are you trying to beef that up or improve it? Uh, oh, one initiative that's in there is a, is a UAV initiative, for instance, to look at uh, how we can uh, do suppression of enemy air defenses better, and that, that is uh, just one of the, the many initiatives. Um, in terms of uh, reconnaissance, uh, that's going to be coming from, from overheads, it's going to be coming from UAVs, it's going to be coming from, uh, from uh, U-2s, uh, you know, all the normal things that would be out there and employed in time of conflict. We're doing our very best to, to, to bring into this experiment and, uh, and uh, understand how we can better use the information that comes from these sensors. And they'll be used live or simulation? Some of each. Some of each, wherever we could, uh, we we wanted to have some live participation at a small scale, and then we scale that up through simulation. Um, so there'll be that's why you see the the mix of aircraft that you you see up here. You know, it's kind of small numbers, but we tried to get as many of the different types as we could to do some live flying, and then uh, what we couldn't cover with live fly because of uh, other commitments, uh, we're going to cover with simulation. And uh, when do you expect to uh, try to integrate, uh, like, the 82nd Airborne into some kind of simulation of taking some, taking an airfield, say, mm -hmm. of some forward base? Mm -hmm. when well, come in? well, they're going to do that as part of the experiment. Um, and then w one of the things we're looking at is, is uh, they'll, they'll be dropped in, they'll secure the area, and then, of course, uh, the way that works is they move out to go off and do other missions. And uh, then the uh, Air Force will bring in organic force protection elements uh, that, that will uh, protect uh, those high-value assets. In this case, it's a forward air operations center. And they'll be working procedures together as to how do we do that and how can we do that better. And how are you going to protect uh, your, for your forward uh, air <coughs> base as you get established? You're going to have your fighter protection in front? Uh, or let's say or, or, surrounding or certainly before you can do an airdrop you're going to have to have uh, you know air superiority you you're not going to be able to drop the 82nd airborne someplace that, that you don't have uh, uh, a way to protect those c-17s or c-130s whatever that are going to be doing the drop in this case c-17s um, so yeah it's a total package mm -hmm. You Do you have Navy and Marine elements in the air too, or, or will all the air actual people doing flying be Air Force? Uh, not this year. Uh, we hope to in future years. That's why I kind of uh, said in my remarks, and we're already into discussion with the other services about being even more joint uh, in uh, during '99. Okay, but not this year. You're going to have three hundred folks at Langley as a, as a rear echelon, right? Right. right. And you're going to have. 100 folks wherever they are. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the commander wherever he is. Right. Okay, so if they need any information, they get on the phone or they get on the tube and well, they write back and it. say, hey, look, we need some information. Sure. You guys get it for them. And sure. We're going to push a lot of information to them. And they're going to be able to draw on their own databases that they have with them uh, to, for information. But when they need something they don't have, yeah. now they've got a place to call to. Okay. Is that three? That is that three hundred people going to be solely, you know, dedicated to that operation, or is that going to be like, that's for? And if say you got five of them going on around the world, sure. That's they're going to support all five. Sure. Of course, uh, your the size of uh, your operation at Langley would would grow significantly in that case. Okay. Right. But in the experiment, we've just given you the numbers for about what we see in the experiment. Okay. The idea is that where the center is is really irrelevant because you have this global network. I mean, it can be sure. here, it could be Idaho. That's correct. You know, place does not matter too much because you've, you've made this investment in this uh, global area network of information. But the information coming from the, loca in, from the battlefield, it, I mean, it's basically available anywhere. Yes. Yes. Upload things right from up in the front, to, and anybody anywhere could get it, right? right. We're on that network. Yes, right? and I can be in an aircraft, or I can be on a ship. And I should be able to pull information out of this global area network. And if I need information on what the weather is because I've gotten a mission change, or I need some threat information because I've gotten a mission change, I have to go into a different area. You can draw on that same global area network of information. So that's where we're going, and we're excited about it. It's going to be fun. Is the uh, air controlling center 
I mean, it's, it's at Langley for this experiment. Is that where yes. you envision it being, or does that depend on, you know, if it's mainly a Navy operation, does it move to Norfolk, or if it's an Army operation, move somewhere else, or? Well, of course, uh, you know, the, the individual that will ultimately make the call on that probably is whoever is designated to be the JFAC, because that's going to be the staff. But we think we're going to be very well equipped, and one of the lead behinds of this experiment is going to be a, a location in uh, some equipment at Langley that can be used for this purpose to support uh, the Joint Forces uh, uh, Air Component Commander. Could also maybe support uh, a Joint Force Commander. Um, and uh, so uh, that those decisions will have to be made further down the road. But but I uh, uh, and we'll have to see how this works. You know, we have to learn. That's what this is about. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Sure. Okay, well thank you for your for your interest. Okay. Hopefully we've answered your questions.